book was a journey. It came from a painful place, which a lot of people's choices in life come from either a painful experience, traumatic experience, or even a happy experience. This journey for me started off, um, I was a practicing physician. I had two really young babies at the time, and I had a beautiful golden retriever. And the dog, my, my firstborn, essentially, because I'm a huge animal lover, um, got really sick at the age of four and a half as a golden retriever. You know, he, he was supposed to at least live a long, as long as 10, 11, 12, we would hope. And it turned out that he had what was called autoimmune hepatitis, where his body's immune system you know, began attacking him at his liver. And it's un extremely rare for dogs, but particularly golden retrievers. And so as an autoimmune disease specialist for humans, um, as a rheumatologist, that was really sad and ironic. Hey, welcome back to Normalize the Conversation. Today, I'm here with Dr. Cohen. She is the co-author of the new best-selling consumer guidebook, Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World. Non-Toxic is published by Oxford University Press and is part of the Dr. Weil Healthy Living Guides. Dr. Cohen is a board-certified rheumatologist and integrative medicine specialist, as well as an environmental health expert in Princeton, New Jersey. She has collaborated with the Environmental Working Group Cancer Smancer, and other disease prevention organizations, and is the co-editor of the textbook, Integrative Environmental Medicine, part of the Oxford University Press slash Weill Integrative Medicine Academic Series. In 2015, she created the smarthuman.com to share environmental health, disease prevention, and wellness information with the public. She lectures, lectures nationally on environmental health topics for elementary, high schools, college, universities, medical schools and physician training programs, and she is a regular expert guest for television, print, and podcast. She has been the recipient of countless awards, including Top Docs New Jersey and Rheumatology from 2016 to 2021, the New Jersey Healthcare Heroes Award in Education for the Smart Human Educational Platform in 2015, and the 2016 Burton L. Eichler Award for Humanitarianism. Dr. Cohen is working to educate and empower the next generation to make smarter lifestyle choices through the creation of environmental health and prevention curricula for schools nationally. Her TEDx talk, How to Protect Your Kids from Toxic Chemicals, can be found on YouTube, and you can follow her health and wellness tips and recommendations on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Smart Human. Sign up for The Smart Human newsletter, read her latest posts at thesmarthuman.com, and listen to her podcast, The Smart Human. Dr. Cohen lives on a farm in New Jersey with her husband, two sons, and lots of furry friends. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you really? Uh, I am doing okay. Great question. And it's nice to check in, but it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's nice to share all this good information, I hope, with your audience. Um, and I'm doing okay. Thank you. Of course. I am so excited to have you here because, like I said before, I read your book. I love it. What I love the most is how clear you are. You explain everything so well. Give us guides on how we can actually utilize this, how we can remove the chemicals. You have ingredients on how to create your own cleaning products, how to pay attention to what chemicals are in the plastic containers, how to read your nutrition labels. It is absolutely amazing. I am so excited but I really want to know what inspired your journey to conduct research on what and how environmental factors can be linked to the quality of our overall health. So I guess, you know, this book was a journey. It came from a painful place, which a lot of people's choices in life come from either a painful experience, traumatic experience, or even a happy experience. This journey for me started off, um, I was a practicing physician. I had two really young babies at the time, and I had a beautiful golden retriever. And the dog, my, my firstborn, essentially, because I'm a huge animal lover, um, got really sick at the age of four and a half as a golden retriever. You know, he, he was supposed to at least live a long, as long as 10, 11, 12, we would hope. And it turned out that he had what was called autoimmune hepatitis, where his body's immune system you know, began attacking him at his liver. And it's un extremely rare for dogs, but particularly golden retrievers. And so as an autoimmune disease specialist for humans, 
um, as a rheumatologist, that was really sad and ironic. Um, and so really, I started trying to figure out what made him sick so early, so young, how he died young, um, and really wanted to see what, what had contaminated maybe his drinking water. We live in New Jersey, so I wanted to make sure his water was clean. I, I didn't know if his food was contaminated. I thought about his toy that he always had in his mouth, this big red plastic toy, never left. Um, I thought about his flea and tick collars. Um, I thought about his medications that he had to be on for various things. Um, that were preventative, so to speak. So, you know, it really was a journey of trying to figure out how to mend my heart. And also, as I was learning about his environment and what could be potentially causing his him harm, it kind of unearthed this whole Pandora's box of human health effects from environmental exposures. And exposures meaning a variety of things, air quality, water quality, um, food chemicals, um, you know, personal care products that, you know, people love to use. I do too, you know, put on your body, feminine care products that you put really internally in your body as, as you know, in the vaginal canal. So, you know, it was just this world of uh, why are we not regulated? Why is our government, why are there not um, systems really set up to protect us from chemicals that are not tested before they go into all of these things? And that was really the start of my journey. And I write about that in the introduction because I want people to understand that none of this comes to us overnight. This is this is a journey for everyone, including a practicing physician who never heard about environmental health in medical school, who never understood or was taught nutrition. Even now, it's not taught in medical school, which is hard to believe. I think your audience is not going to believe that. Um, and so I wanted people to really understand that I was as much of a novice as most people sitting there, you know, like yourself, reading the book for the first time and having an eye-opening experience. That was my journey too. And had I had this book back then, I would have been much more able to, you know, to navigate the world around me, around my children, um, and kind of really see how these chemicals, at, even at low doses, can affect our health short and long term. I'm really happy that you brought up how this wasn't something that you learned in medical school. This wasn't something that you knew beforehand, because I think a lot of people hesitate to believe that there are toxins and chemicals in our food, in our water, in our personal care products, because wouldn't our doctors tell us about it? Wouldn't our doctors know and tell us, don't do this, pay attention to this. But if it's not something they're learning, it's not something that they can offer us. So understanding that just because you haven't heard it before, it doesn't mean it's not real and not important. So you that's exactly true. Thank you for bringing that up because look, there's things in high school we don't learn that are true and real. It's just that there's a certain core curriculum that they allow in for a certain number of hours. Um, you know, in medical school, and even now I, I know several deans of medical schools, and I've said, listen, I'll give you 20, 30, 40 hours of curriculum on nutrition, on environmental health. I'll give it to you for free because I want these kids and people to learn this for their future to help other people. Um, and they literally, and I mean this as of like a week ago, even another commentary from a dean of a medical school, they say that they're teaching towards the board exams, which are simply based on criteria of diseases and pharmaceutical therapies. And that's what they're still doing now. And, you know, and they want to change things, but they can't because they're subsidized by pharmaceutical companies. And there's all these, you know, sort of political back, back, back stuff going on with a lot of these residencies and medical programs. So my goal was to get to younger people on my own. That's how I decided not just young people, but everyone through the smart human um, and go direct to consumers because consumers want this. And then also, you know, really work on, on getting into high schools. That's my lifelong goal now is to really teach this younger um, because teenagers want this information. I did pilot, pilot, you know, this is part of the TED talk, but I, you know, I ran a couple pilot projects because my babysitter was so interested in what I was doing and, and doctors weren't at the time. And um, it really turned out that based on the pilot projects, collecting data of understanding and interest and all of that, young people want this. They want to know what they put on their bodies. They're, they're self-conscious, which is normal. They're insecure, which is totally normal, but that's a great window for opportunity for the health and wellness information that, that can be provided. Exactly. And one thing we don't realize is cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, different autoimmune diseases, we can have the genes for it and we don't have to activate them. And people don't realize that just because you have the gene, it doesn't have to be activated. 
and how we take care of ourselves, our bodies, or how we fuel our bodies as well can dictate that. And that's something that's that- true. Yeah, that's your exposome. So what you're describing beautifully is the fact that we all have genes. Um, we have sometimes um, abnormalities in our genes that we'll never know about, or we can test for, but we don't know really what to do with that information. But 90% of what goes on in our, in our health, really, almost 90%, is from our environment. And environment not only includes chemicals, which you know a lot of what this book is about is chemicals, but I do have a whole bunch of information on also how stress affects our, our, our gene expression and our um, expression of disease, even earlier or later in life. Stress is one thing, sleep is another. You know, Sleep is a huge component of our immune system. Um, and I talk about that in the book, trying to get people to understand it's not just the quantity of sleep, but it's the quality of your sleep and how we remove chemicals while we sleep. We have these under, unbelievable mechanisms around the brain to release those chemicals as waste. Um, but we also have light pollution pollution, noise pollution. You know, we've been evolving for over 4.5 million years and we've had only, you know, 200 or 150 years of, of chemicals in our lives, 95,000 of them now. So if you're looking at the whole span of the human genome and the genetics and how we've evolved to eat clean food, not dirty food and clean drinking water and, um, you know, have natural light when we wake up and work, um, you know, and less noise pollution and less stress, you can see how there's this mismatch between what our our genetics have been building on and evolving with, and then boom, this very short period of so, so much dramatic modern change. Exactly. And we don't realize that. And I think a lot of the older generations say, well, I've been doing this for 70 years and I'm fine. So why do I have to change? But they don't realize that new chemicals are coming out. Things are changing and they also can adapt. And they realize that their bodies are aching more. Their memory is going. And these all can be attributed to the chemicals that they're putting on their body, around the body, their sleep, like you said, the environmental pollution, it all is linked together. And I think that people don't realize the long-term effects. We're straight to the short-term effects. If I did this now and I feel fine, then it's fine. Right. A lot of exposures don't smack you in the face or give you a rash or cause something that gives you shortness of breath. I mean, those are certainly allergies that we now know of if you have, you know, a severe allergy to dairy or to um, peanuts or to something that can really cause a life and death situation. That's certainly visual and real. Um, but then people don't necessarily believe that when you have low level exposures of, you know, chemicals in personal care products repetitively, daily, weekly, monthly, or chemicals in our food, like processed foods have over 1200, if not more, food additives that are not even tested for safety before they go into our food, which blows everyone's mind. Um, same with personal care products. There's no law regulating the testing for safety of chemicals that are in all of our personal care, care products. Um, and we go into the, you know, the regulatory and the legislative failures in the book. So people kind of really understand that these were, there were efforts made, but they failed and they're still failing. So we have to do it for ourselves. You know, we have to really be aware as consumers, what we do for ourselves, because we don't really have any regulatory oversight. Um, drinking water is a really big issue for me. I, I really don't think people, and I never did too. So I'm saying this, you know, as a novice as well, that we didn't, I didn't understand how dirty our drinking water is. Even our, our you know, um, water treatment plants cannot remove the chemicals, majority of the chemicals that do get into our water treatment plants that serve 80% of our population. Well, water has their own issue as well. So everyone should be filtering their water. And we can talk about that. Um, but there, you know, it's a big topic. And the reason the book is laid out in chapters that I think people can wrap their head around. So there's a drinking water chapter. There's, you know, what do you want to do if you want to get pregnant and how do you prepare your body? Because of course, in utero exposures during pregnancy are really quite important. And we lay that case out based on the science, but we have a chapter on, you know, food and food quality and how to read labels and all this sort of food industry tricks that you need to figure out to sort of, you know, wallow through and get cleaner food. We have a chapter on personal care products, a, a chapter on 
um, home furnishings, how to choose couches without flame retardants. And I literally show my own labels from my own journey. Much of the pictures in here are from my own experience trying to figure this out. Um, and there's even a chapter, by the way, two extra chapters that I think people don't realize is on medication. So, you know, medications are phenomenal and I make a case for all these great medications and, and such, you know, changes in human health and longevity. But there are medications that we take really reflexively that actually can be harmful. And if we're not taking them with the utmost, um, you know, uh, understanding, we might be taking them when there's other alternatives. And I give a lot of alternatives for pain medicine and those kind of things. There's a chapter on radiation so that all of us, including myself, I have my cell phone and computer and I'm all teched out. But how we use our technology can really make a big difference in terms of radiation exposure, certainly for young people, if you're carrying your phone in your pockets, near your groin, uh, women who carry them in their bras, you don't want that radiation close to your body, close to your skin, close to your head. And then I give a bunch of ways to manage your cell phone technology safely so that we can live with them, but we can live in a safer world where we're not affecting our fertility. We're not creating breast lesions with radiation from the phone. So, so I want people to just understand I'm with you. I live in this real world. I color my hair. I, my kids eat Skittles when I don't want them to, but they do. The point is, is that we just we have to live in this world. So here's a, here's the best way to do it. The most safe that I can discover from the science. You know, I found everything in your book so fascinating. And like you said, there are so many chemicals that aren't regulated, aren't tested for. And you hear about all these acts being made as if they are monitoring everything. But you talked about how so many chemicals were grandfathered in that they never had to test, that it didn't matter. That was crazy to me. Like, how do we just ignore it? And there was evidence, um, glyphosate, about how it could cause cancer and how it is linked to cancer. And that's not banned. And they know it, they're aware, and yet they're not stopping it. Yeah, they just banned it for, um, and I post on the Smart Human, especially Instagram, I do a lot of instant posts on new regulatory changes and kind of keep people really on top of some changes that happen. Um, and I just posted on this, glyphosate is going to be banned from, uh, they're going to ban Roundup in household use um, over the next, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's over the next five years, maybe. So people don't realize that Roundup, which is one of the most popular herbicides that people spray to get rid of weeds in their front yards and around their house, actually is glyphosate, which is incredibly you know, harmful pesticide. And there are thousands of harmful pesticides, but this one got a lot of attention because it was linked to um, various cancers, blood cancers, multiple myeloma, leukemia. And that was because of two very high profile cases where a, um, a uh, gardener for a, a school developed this cancer and it was, it was linked to his, you know, his use of this uh, herbicide around the school for his entire career. There was another one. He got 58 million, I think, was the payout. Another one also. And, you know, these kind of cases are so critical because they're the only thing. Money is the only thing that moves the system. Money moves the market. If people listening buy cleaner products that are legitimately cleaner, and we'll talk about the vetted sites because you don't want to take anyone's word for it as natural, organic, you know, none of that in the personal care industry is real. Uh, it's marketing. And so I give examples of, of websites that you can actually look up your products. And I do this with high school kids, but nothing moves the market like money. And it's a sad way of looking at it, but it's true. If people buy cleaner products that are truly cleaner um, with less chemicals, that's going to move the market in a cleaner direction. And I think that's the underlying movement beyond just teaching young people about these products. It's to get them their, their dollars as they move into adulthood to really help move the market towards a cleaner place as well. Exactly. Consumers dictate the products and we don't realize that. And one thing I hear all the time is, well, if I stop buying this, it's not going to make a difference if one person does. But if one person does and you share that with your friends and your family members and they do it and they share it, that's where change happens. But if you're not willing to make that first step, what if no one is? Nothing right. will change. So we and have I, the power. Who did I quote? Margaret Mead is one of the most famous people when it comes to, um, I'm trying to figure out where I put it here. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. 
Uh, Margaret Mead was an American cultural anthropologist, um, and she was just really famous for kind of inspiring people to not look at the rest of the world as being like overwhelming and that their vote or their their consumer dollar doesn't matter or their voice doesn't matter, no matter what it is. It's, it's really about saying, listen, there are lots of things that change when each individual does something different, something better. Um, or votes, for instance. So, you know, never discount your vote as insignificant um, because it really is the only thing that does move, especially in this world of environmental health. It's been done before. I mean, um, you know, lead, let's give an example. Lead was taken out of, um, you know, gasoline and paint in 1970s, 1978. Um, and a lot of other products, because lead was added to gasoline to make the knocks go away. And it made the engine work better at that time when engines needed that. Um, but lead ended up getting into our bodies. It ended up getting into our skin, our bodies through um, paint, uh, through gasoline fumes. And it was correlated to a variety of, of mental health conditions, including um, higher rates of, car uh, of incarceration and jails, mental health issues, suicidality. Um, uh, so there was there was this connection that was finally discovered through some very clever physicians um, who also happened to look at the teeth of newborns um, and, and was like rings of a tree. So, you know, our history is is, you know, we can look back and say it's very discouraging, given that there's so many thousands of unregulated chemicals that made their way into the market. But we've had some really interesting successes. And one of them was the removal of lead from those products. Now, we still have lead in our drinking water, as we all know from Flint, Michigan. We have it all over the country. And we talk about it in the book. Um, and it kind of goes back to the punchline. Listen, we can only do so much. Uh, if we keep waiting for things to change, we're going to be here forever and we're going to get sicker. So here's the recommendation. Um, you know, what water that has led from lead piping and lead infrastructure that wasn't able to be changed out. Well, you know what? The solution is get a great filter system, um, you know, like reverse osmosis or at the very least a carbon filter. These are not costly anymore, depending on, you know, I guess who I'm talking to, but they're really not costly anymore. They're not prohibit prohibitive. And they can make a huge difference in your whole lifespan because you drink so much water. So um, again, lead is one example of having good things that we did in the you know, in terms of public health. But then we're still battling that issue. And, and now, actually, fifty percent of um, American children have uh, lead in their body above the level that's considered healthy, the blood lead level. So this is all new data. Um, but we're still battling that issue of lead, which can, you know, contribute to ADHD and anxiety disorders. And, you know, a lot of kids get put on medication for ADHD and anxiety and depression when they just need to get a blood lead level. Believe it. So I recommend that in terms of um, testing young people. And that really reminds me in your book, when you talked about how our decisions today can affect our children and our grandchildren, it takes three generations to wipe it out and to start over. So we don't realize that by not making these changes, we're not just affecting us. We're not the only ones who are getting hurt. We're not just cheating ourselves. We are setting up our kids and our grandkids and that next generation to have these same issues and they can cause mental health issues. They can cause different um, autoimmune diseases. We're starting them off in an unfair place when we can start making these changes today and give them a chance. But I really want to dive into the water. According to the 1972 Safe Drinking Water Act, you mentioned how only 91 out of 90,000 exposed chemicals are tested, monitored, and regulated. And we need yeah. water. Absolutely. So this has become, I kind of use the metaphor, it's risen to the top is literally my biggest pet peeve. And I mean, I have a lot of pet peeves because look at the variety of, of issues in the book, but, you know, that are going on in terms of environmental exposures. But this one really upsets me the most because I see it as such a fixable issue and, you know, high yield changes that can really, you know, make people's lives so much healthier. So just to, to step back a little, you know, our drinking water in the United States is probably some of the cleanest in the world. And I want to make a comment to that because people have much dirtier water in places around the world as well. So many of them contend with our same issues, but a lot have, you know, much dirtier water, certainly in third world countries. But that being said, we have an infrastructure of about 160,000 water 
treatment plants or wastewater treatment. So that's the system that takes our water from the sinks and the toilets that we flush and kind of recycles it into a treatment plant that's supposed to clean it off and then send it back out to our pipes. Okay. But other things contribute to those, that water system. So, you know, streams and lakes and underground aquifers, which are, you know, almost like underground rivers that are below the ground that make their way all the way through the system into our treatment plants and then into our our cups. Um, so 160,000 water treatment plants um, follow a law from 1972. It has some amendments in 1974. But essentially, the most important takeaway is that it only covers 91 chem chemicals. Out of what we now have, which as I mentioned, 95,000 has actually grown since this book, believe it or not, was published a year ago. Um, so we have 95,000 chemicals that come from, you know, air pollution and exhaust and fumes that end up on water bodies that come into our water. We have fracking chemicals. We have coal ash. We have uh, manufacturing runoff that's allowable in many states that make their way into streams and lakes. Um, we have flooding that causes uh, wells and tankers and things to over, overflow into our water, drinking water system. We have fertilizers, pesticides. And what people don't also realize is that our sewage, believe it or not, gets recycled into drinking water. So, you know, antipsychotics, oral contraceptives, blood pressure medications are all from the toilet making their way back through these water treatment plants. And then since they're not washed off, they're not included in those 91, because those 91 were from 1976 or 1972, actually, uh, they get right back into our drinking water and they travel through plastic piping, PVC piping, which is not great, or lead piping, which has not been fixed. So when we get a glass of water from our sink, whether it comes from a well, which has its own issues, or it comes from municipal tap water that's only managing 91 chemicals, we're getting a load of chemicals potentially and likely that we need to figure out why are we doing that to our body when we may have just exercised to get rid of chemicals and to sweat or you go to the gym and you go to the shower and they have all these chemical shampoo, conditioner and body washes for free. You know, we got to think about what are we getting rid of, you know, with good intention and then all of a sudden we're putting it right back into our bodies. So we never really walk around clean unless we make a conscious way of doing that. I just can't believe that medications are even going into our drinking water and they haven't updated the lead pipes. And this is all information that people know and they're not doing anything. So as consumers, as individuals, how can we make sure our water is clean and make sure we're putting the right things in our bodies? So the first thing I say is any filtration is good. I mean, I don't want to give anyone the impression that doing, you know, a low level situation that's easy and cheaper for them at the time is a, is a waste. I believe every filtration system, whether it's a pitcher like a Brita or a zero water with the, those are called carbon blocks where they sit in the little filters. You have to change them out regularly. That's worth something or the carbon block filters that are in the refrigerator door. You make sure that they're changed regularly so that you don't let them block, block back up. And then of course they don't work as well. Um, and then if you have the ability to, to look into a reverse osmosis water filter, they call them RO filters. You want to try to look into an RO filter because they're under the sink in your kitchen. Um, you can put it in apartments, you can put it in houses, but essentially it's just for where you're drinking your water. So it splits the water line into the junky water for cleaning dishes and the plumber, you know, creates this other line for the water to go super clean through, you know, multiple filters, including the RO. And then it fills up a tank even while you're sleeping. So they have this little tank and that's where the faucet draws from for drinking and cooking. So if you can up front have some costs, it's about 275, the one we recommend. I don't say brands, but um, you can, so I'll, I can chat with you later. But essentially the idea is there's plenty of great companies made in America, all parts, you don't want anything outsourced to other countries, including in, especially the filter portion. Um, we buy ours from a company in California. California tends to have the highest oversight in terms of their products in general. Um, not all, but in general. 
And, um, you know, essentially the prices come down. I mean, like with everything, cell phones, VHS machines, you're probably too young to remember a VHS machine, but essentially they started off very, very expensive and very prohibitive. No one could get one. And then eventually they dropped in price because there was competition. And so really a good reverse osmosis that's highly certified, that's on consumer reports, that's NSF certified, NSF, I can't remember what it's means, but it's in the book. Um, yeah, I wish I remembered that off the top of my head, but I'm old. Anyway, so that that's the kind of filter that you want to get for reverse osmosis. And, you know, often landlords have heard of them and you can put them in and you can take them out when you leave or you're not renting an apartment or a home. Um, so to me, that's the more extreme way to go. It's also worth it if you can afford the upfront cost because it's much cheaper um, you know, when you just pay up a front, it's like $40 a year to change out the cartridges. That's it. Wow. But it's cheaper than even bottled water and bottled water has its issues, which people instinctively think is better. I would agree to the to most part, but the plastics that are in plastic bottles, you don't know where they've leached out in a hundred degree weather for six months, a year in a warehouse. Those are actually called endocrine disrupting chemicals, which is what I talk a lot about. And they can affect your hormones. So they can affect your mind, your mood, your fertility, growth and development. They can affect um, uh, hormone sensitive cancers, breast cancer risk, testosterone, uh, uh, testicular, prostate, endometrial, thyroid. Um, so you really want to think about um, not using plastics as much as possible, whether it's food storage, certainly not heating food and drinks in hot plastics, not having coffee and tea in a plastic cup. Um, and I would argue even uh, plastic drinking water. I would go with stainless steel glass. And then you have a system. You fill up at home, you take it with you in your glass and stainless steel containers with no straws that are plastic. People forget that. And you know, 90%, 80% of the time you're getting water that you control in terms of quality. And then if you're out at a restaurant or you're traveling, you know, life is life and you just, you know, buy bottled water or whatever you feel comfortable with. You also mentioned in the book how even like a plastic lid on top of the stainless steel bottles can be just as bad. And well, if you're sipping, yeah, if you're sipping, I mean, like this is my, my coffee and tea today. And I made a point to get the twist off because if I had the flip, I would use it. I'm human. I'm, you know, we all want the easy route, right? So I would just flip it and drink it. And then that hot tea and coffee is going through all that hot plastic, you really saved yourself nothing, you know? So you really want to make, do the extra work and try to make sure that, you know, when you're drinking from something, it's not hot plastic. And if you can just, you know, drink from glass or stainless steel, um, it's a really great way to go. Um, I'll show another thing to you. I have, you know, in my office, I have a water carafe. I fill it up once a week. And so if I can't really grab for you know, anything else, I'll just have my clean RO filter. I have one in my office because they're so inexpensive. I figured why not? So, you know, the idea is that if you set yourself up for that one system and that's the one thing you do for the next six months of your life, it would be a huge impact, um, I believe, on your health. Exactly. And you also talked about how like baby bottles and sports drink bottles have, um, they banned BPA, but they replaced them with BPS, BP. F, I think was one of them or BSF? Yeah, BSIP. I mean, there's hundreds of them. They're called bisphenols and they're a compound um, that if you just tweak it a little bit, you get a completely different compound to some degree, but then it has also been found to show to have the same harmful effects as BPA. And in fact, I'll, I'll shout out to my co-author. So Dr. Fred Von Saul, who is my co-author, he's like the real deal emeritus professor who doesn't get bells and whistles, doesn't go to Hollywood parties. This is the guy that through his research and international colleagues with their research was able to get bis bisphenol A or BPA out of baby bottles in 2012. Now it begs the question, if this stuff is so bad for babies coming from plastic bottles and it's an endocrine disrupting chemical, like so many of the ones I discuss and can affect hormones in babies, why is it not taken out of everything else that has BPA, like canned foods, canned drinks, all cans in this country and around the world is lined with the same plastic coating that has the BPA endocrine disruptor. So I've tried very hard to avoid all cans, whether it's canned soda and canned seltzer, canned juices, canned anything, canned foods, even organic foods often have the cans with BPA, which is ironic. So, you know, if you can move to frozen organic foods, which are even cheaper in many ways than fresh, 
but they also maintain all of their nutrient value because most frozen produce that's organic is flash frozen when it's picked. So it's actually maintains all nutrient value, doesn't have to travel across the country to be fresh in a, in a, you know, in a supermarket, but organic means that it also all those chemicals and pesticides are removed. So for your audience, try to move in a direction where it's USDA organic, which has the only teeth in this country in terms of any regulatory oversight, I would say stick with USDA organic foods and drinks, um, because that's where you'll have the least pesticide load. But frozen organics actually makes it much more cheaper to keep them in your freezer and, and use them whenever you want. You know, in the book, you also talked about the organic label. So I'm really happy you brought that up, the USDA or certified organic versus if someone just writes organic. And I didn't realize that that's actually a completely different thing. Yeah. And then you looked at the original diet of humans, how it was low in grains. It had nutrient-filled carbohydrates, high in magnesium, low in sodium. And then you spoke about how today you have meat that comes from animals fed with hormones and growth stimulating hormones. You have strawberries fumigated by workers in hazmat suits fish farmed in overcrowded, dirty pens, fed contaminants with PCBs, and makes you think how different it is that we're fueling our bodies and why testing for these chemicals is so important. And if we can eliminate eliminate even 95% of them by having that USDA organic label on it is so important. But I was wondering, how does consuming non-organic food rather than organic lead to additional health and mental health risks? Yeah, it's a great question. So you can remove chemicals, so to speak, if you buy USDA organic, which removes a, a large portion. I mean, there are some that made it through the system, but let's just say it's the best thing we have unless you're growing your own food, which most people don't have time to do. I, I encourage it, but um, but here's how things work. Um these chemicals, like say, for instance, you're looking for green, fresh kale salad and you think you're, you know, you're going after that kale salad, spinach salad. You really want to be healthy. You're trying to do everything you can to stick to vegetables, for instance. Well, it turns out that non-organic produce, including and especially kale and spinach are some of the highest laden with pesticides in the country compared to other produce, believe it or not. So there's a group called Environmental Working Group, which I talk about a wonderful organization online, and they do every year, they test produce across the country that's not organic, that's called conventional. Uh, so they test conventional pro produce, vegetables and fruit across the country to get an idea of which particular produce um, has the highest load of pesticides on the surface of their, of their skin versus those that have the lowest. And they call this the dirty dozen and the clean 15, which are the clean 15 conventional that you could buy technically not being organic and maybe save money, maybe you have better access to those. So every year, the top ones almost consistently, and we have the list in the book for 2021 um, or 2020, I can't remember, but it's, it's, it's consistent every year. The top ones are berries, strawberries, blueberries, you know, all the berries because they don't have a, a shell, right? They're just thin skin, peaches, but kale and spinach, some of the highest pesticide loads. So people are eating these great salads, which is wonderful. You need the fiber, you need other nutrients from those foods, but, and nutrient, you know, and some of the vitamins, but you're also getting this load of pesticides that you never asked for, never wanted. So you can wash it in baking soda. You can soak in white vinegar to get a lot of residues off of non-organic produce. So people know they have that option too. Um, but here's what happens with those pesticides. So you eat the salad, and it, what it does is it's killing off what we have in our gut called the gut microbiome. So we've evolved for millions of years because I love anthropology and that's what the smart human was based on in terms of its title. Um, we've been evolving for millions of years to have literally these bugs and parasites living within us for good reason. I mean, they manage nutrients from food. Um, they, they protect our immune system, which is the human gut. It's just a tube, but these guys actually line the tube. So bacteria, molds, yeast, parasites, all play together in a healthy environment, believe it. And um, when you take in a lot of pesticides, whether it's from food, like kale and spinach and um, you know other produce that may have a lot of it, or even processed foods, you're knocking off, they're going to go after and kill off those good bacteria that protect us 
protect our immune system. Um, same with chlorinated drinking water. Again, back to the water, if they're adding chlorination to clean off bacteria, which they have to do for public health, but they don't remove it again once it's cleaned off and it travels now 20, 30, 40 miles to your home, it's still got all that chlorinated chemicals, those detergents, those guys are meant to kill bacteria. So they're gonna do that in your gut. So because the gut and the brain are so connected in terms of communication, the hardier, healthier your gut is with the best clean bacteria, um, the more likely it's going to help with the brain connection, which is for mental health, anxiety, sleep. Um, and so really everything begins in the gut. So the best you can do to remove those chemicals and exposures, the really the best it's going to be for mental health as well. You know, when I first heard about that, I didn't believe it. I was like, how does your gut health link to your mental health? Like that didn't make sense to me. And I wasn't sleeping well. I was so exhausted all the time. I had all this anxiety constantly. I went and got an MRT panel done just to see what foods were sensitive in my body. And I removed all those foods. I started making sure everything was organic. I cooked a lot of things from scratch. I just changed everything. I'm now back to being able to get a good night of sleep and wake up in the morning and have this energy and not feel like I'm dying every day able to do things without my heart racing constantly. So it's actually amazing how much your gut can affect your mental health and even your immune system. I stopped getting sick so easily. I had chronic pneumonia for like ever, and it's been over a year. It's amazing. Yeah, food is medicine. I mean, Hippocrates said this in 460 BC before Christ. I mean, we know that food is medicine. Medicine has, I mean, food has so many of the new, I mean, not processed foods, but really unprocessed whole foods um, really have all that nutrient value independently of the chemicals, as I mentioned with organics, but the nutrient value of food has been lost over the last several decades. You know, we really don't have the high quality soil um, that we would like to think we have. We, we transport food from long distances. We store food before it goes to the supermarkets. And so really we have to kind of think about how do we get fresher, cleaner, more nutrient rich foods because those foods feed the gut bacteria. I mean, it's like feeding the zoo. Those bacteria, molds, yeast, viruses, all the good guys in our gut that support our immune system and help with our mental health, they have to get fed. We have to feed the zoo. So you're really creating this almost ecosystem between outside your body, inside your body. And we've, again, we've been evolving for millions of years to need those nutrients. We've changed a lot in just two or three generations. Um, it's really remarkable. We have such a high load of um, high fructose corn syrups and fake sweeteners and all sorts of preservatives that are linked to, you know, increased risk for cancers. Um, we're killing off the good guys that really support us. And so you want to just do everything you can to keep them healthy. And stress is a part of it too. You know, it's not just the food and drinking water quality, which certainly is a big, big aspect, but stress changes the level of acidity in our gut, right? You know, that's why people get ulcers from stress ulcers. Um, it's because that influx of stress of acid doesn't stop. It's just ongoing. So people take medications to stop those cells that make acid, but that's not a great thing either, because in the short term, it works and it helps heal an ulcer, which is a good thing. But if you're on them too long, you're also changing the chemistry of your gut that has evolved for millions of years. And that acidity, when it's needed, extracts the nutrients from food we eat. So it shouldn't be on all the time. And so the idea is that, you know, if you can manage even upstream stressful situations and it's very stressful time, um, you want to manage the stress because that's what's the upstream cause or association with how your gut is doing from an acidity level. So, you know, you can't, you always have to do the work, you know, whether it's going out in nature or getting rid of toxic people or exercising, which is so good for mental health in terms of serotonin and blood flow. Um, it's just, you, you want to grab the things that reduce stress because that too will play a role in your gut. Exactly. And when you talked about frozen food, what a lot of us don't realize, I was definitely one of them, is they come in these packages, even certified organic, where it tells you to microwave them. I and I did this for years. I mean, the half the stuff that I would say the majority of this stuff, I never did. 
for the most of my life. I mean, up until about 15 years ago is when I started to get a little smarter about it or 10 years ago even, but we had these steaming bags and I was a young mom and I was busy and I had kids screaming and yelling and the kid and the dog and the cat, and whatever. And so I would just throw a bag in, steam it up and then put it into a plate. Well, it turns out that when you heat up plastics, which makes sense because it's not a very strong material, no matter whatever kind of plastic it is, it will seep into the food and drinks that it's being heated and it's surrounding. Um, I use the example of Tupperware that when you buy Tupperware, it's super clear. You can read right through it. And when you wash it a couple of times in the dishwasher at high heat, which is what dishwashers do, it becomes opaque. You cannot see through it after one or two washes. And that's a clear indication that that material, that matrix is not strong enough to stay where it should. And it migrates, same with um, nonstick pans and the perfluoralkyls that are so devastatingly harmful to us now that we know those nonstick, nonstick chemicals from nonstick pans will get into the foods that are cooked on those pans, especially if they're fatty, like eggs or things that we typically would cook in them, stir fries, that sucks some of the chemicals into the fats because these are fat loving chemicals, many of them. So just swapping out, you know, go to Marshall's, TJ Maxx, Home Goods. I don't know, I'm not on work for any of them, but just grab a stainless steel pan that's, you know, made in America. Um, that's, that's got, um, we even talk about it, the 18 slash eight stamp on the bottom, which is food grade steel. Everything in the book directs people to, to things that are not expensive. And the most important thing is what you remove. And that costs nothing. In fact, it saves money, right? Air fresheners. Who needs air fresheners? I mean, I had a whole drawer of Glades plugins once. And I remember I just dumped the whole drawer when I really knew how much of an effect those phthalates, those chemicals in them can have on our body. I just got rid of the whole drawer, you know, because you know, we can remove stuff in our lives by just not even bringing them into our home, not spending the money, Glades plugins, lots of cleaning products, not regulated. Um, just go back to basics, vinegar, um, you know, vinegar is great for cleaning. It stinks, but you can add lemon oil that's real. You can add baking soda to water and scrub. You can use sea salt for scrubbing. That's, you know, very coarse. Um, and we give all those recipes, but you can also look up safer, cleaner products with the um, resources we gave as well, if you're not going to make stuff. You know, when you talked about all of that in the book, you talked about how the word fragrance can, is can, compromised of so many different chemicals. And you think fragrance, you're like, oh, okay, like that's nothing, but it's a bunch of chemicals that they don't have to list. Exactly. They're proprietary. So back to the fact that our, our kind of oversight, our regulatory oversight in the U.S. fails us, it is true. Um, it's based, you know, our government in terms of these products um, favors uh, manufacturing. And they do this because they don't require any chemicals in any products, not food. I mean, food has some other twists to it, but in terms of personal care products, body sprays and deodorants, antiperspirant shampoos, conditioners, you name it, none of them are required to test their ingredients before they go into the products and end up on the shelves and end up inside us because they do make their way into our bloodstream, believe it. So, um, you know, the word fragrance or perfume, if you look on a label, can be comprised of upwards of 300, 400, you know, an untold number of chemicals because they do not have to disclose those individual chemicals. Um, and so one of the key things to do when you're looking for products, if you don't choose to look them up through Environmental Working Group's website, which is great, um, is to just avoid things that have the word perfume or fragrance on the ingredients label of the um, personal care product. And if it says organic on the front, Keep in mind, they can do that falsely because they could have one ingredient in that list that is organic and 90 that are literally just total toxic waste. So in personal care products, organic has no value. That is just mind blowing that they don't have to test any of it. They don't have to disclose it. And yet we all just purchase it with no idea. And I remember when you wrote about how like lotions we put on ourselves or even like medications for rashes or something, how it can go right into our bloodstream. All these- some are, Yeah, some are intended. Like as a physician, you know, there are drugs that we put on the skin that we're hoping to get into the bloodstream. Like that's how they're designed to work. So why, what's the hypocrisy of putting all these chemicals on our bodies and thinking that they won't get into our bloodstream? 
you know, because they're all designed with many chemicals that break through the top layer, which is very protective, but can still go through our skin. And we can see this because BPA, for instance, not only is ingested through canned foods, through receipts have BPA on them, um, but BPA uh, also can go through the skin. And in fact, there was a study I talked about, there's many of them, but one of them was about how they tested a cashier register um, check out people and they found that they had some of the highest loads of BPA in their bloodstream and they they believe it's correlated to the amount of um, BPA they touch on a daily basis with the receipts. So I recommend patient, you know, people, patients, consumers, um, especially if you work as a checkout person to have band-aids on your fingers or, or nitrile gloves, not necessarily latex, but nitrile. You can get them anywhere, but at least you're stopping that absorption into your skin. Um, so there's all sorts of cool hacks. I have travel hacks when you're traveling, what to know about airplane water, airplane food, you know, gym hacks about what I learned when I was going to the gym and how much junk is free on the wall in the shower after you've just sweated out all these horrible chemicals. It, it's just, I'm looking through life through very much, you know, chemical eyes. And, and I just kind of post and relate it back as much as I can because there's simple changes, you know? They are really simple changes. and we tend not to be educated on them, which is one of the reasons I admire your work because you're giving us the information that we don't have, that the whole system is working against us and we don't realize it. We just assume everything's safe. We assume good intentions. We assume that looking at different ingredients, if certain chemicals aren't listed, then they're completely fine. And not realizing that these other chemicals are being replaced with ones that are just as bad or they're not disclosed. Right, it's a whack-a-mole. It's a whack-a-mole of chemicals and the chemical industry knows this. And they know that it's gonna take years to even have all of these academic bodies from around the world figure it out. They just keep moving. And only five chemicals have ever been fu fully removed from the US market, 11 chemicals in total from cosmetics just since the 1970s, that's 50 years ago. In Europe, they've removed over 1,200 chemicals because they have a much more stringent, robust regulatory system. So we're really living in a time where, you know, it's a wild, wild west. And so, you know, as a physician, I'm seeing sicker people uh, with more autoimmune diseases that have no history of family, family history of those diseases. You couldn't even blame it on your genes if you wanted to. Um, I'm seeing younger people with thyroid conditions. That used to be an old lady, usually, or an old man, but usually old lady disease or issue. That's fixed very easily because we are just deficient as a culture in certain micronutrients that protect our thyroid, like iodine. So, you know, I talk about a lot of that chloride, some of these chemicals that compete with the iodine for the thyroid because they're modern day chemicals, but we have iodine that's not even in our diet anymore. If we used to eat a lot more iodine from clean, fresh produce and beans, and I listed some, and also um, obviously seafood that was clean, and that was protective. And now we're seeing this change of nutrient intake on top of environmental chemicals. And that's where we're getting this sort of explosion of illness. And so all I'm trying to do is not scare people. I really have no intention of scaring people. I want people aware. I want people informed. I look at knowledge as power. I don't look at it as, as something to be scared of. And I think living um, a very similar life to people out there, stressed, work issues, kid issues, you know, sickness, illness issues, we just have to muddle through, but in a way that I think is not going to cost us too much money and is makes really good common sense because that's when we stick to these habits, not if it's a diet or a fad or it's short term. You know, you're preparing us to make educated decisions and that's what we need. However, most of us tend to be very reactive instead of preventative. So do you have any maybe warning signs that people can look out for that there might be chemicals or toxins in their environment that are causing different physical or mental health symptoms? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's just so many chemicals you know, when I talk to physicians and colleagues, I have to break them down in chemical groups and it gets really overwhelming, I think, but that's sort of the level of what they need to hear sometimes. When I talk to just everyday people, I say, listen, I don't know what's in your drinking water. I didn't even have mine tested. It looks like sludge in the book if you look at it. 
I don't test things. I don't go after a lot of testing because I just assume we're all filled with chemicals until proven otherwise, because there's a lot of data to support that. There was a study in 2005 that looked at 10 newborns and found they had over 200 chemicals in their cord blood, which is the cord connection to the mother. So we're really kind of born polluted despite every pregnant woman's intentions, if to be clean, unfortunately, we do get chemicals in, in the bloodstream of our fetus. I mean, this is one of the reasons I like to go after high school and young students, because they'll make those choices and get maybe cleaner in their choices before they get pregnant or want to get pregnant if they choose to do that. But the idea is that, um, you know, the best way to go about this process is really slow, and, you know, pick one thing that sort of intrigues you and go after it. Um, you know, a lot of people listening drink water out of water bottles. One of the best places you can start before even a filter is just change out your drinking water bottle you carry around to something that's glass or stainless steel. Um, another easy one is just to not buy all the cleaning products that, we're think, that we think we need to buy because we need to be so clean. Door handles and window cleaners. And it's just a crazy industry. Go back to basics clean house. Um, look up your makeup. You know, if you're, you know, most women use about 10 to 15 products daily, especially teenagers. They use more than any other demographic. Men use on average six um, and women, uh, adult women use about 12. So teenagers really have the market on personal care and makeup. Just look them up on, you know, ewg.org slash skin deep. It's, it, I'll repeat it again, ewg.org slash skin deep. And they're a vetted group that actually looks at the chemicals in personal care products and cleaning products. Um, so you can look up stuff and decide what works and what doesn't work. I do this with high school students and then you're done, you know? So it's one of those things where you just have to do it in a timely fashion that doesn't scare you and start eating things that nutrify your body clean pesticide-free foods like cruciferous vegetables, they are enormously beneficial for detoxing the body from chemicals. They make the liver churn up bad chemicals. Um, you know, try a good clean multivitamin to get micronutrients like iodine in a safe way. Um, and I mean, no coloring, additive preservatives and those multivitamins, like really good quality. Um, Whole Foods is you know, I don't promote anything, but, you know, if you go to a health food store, they tend to have better products and people that are educated to talk to you about those in terms of a multivitamin. Um, you know, adding clean drinking water, clean food, getting more sleep is incredibly important for mental health. Um, and again, surrounding yourself with people who support you, um, who aren't, you know, giving you anxiety every time you're in their presence. These are really important things to help your body thrive. It's very anthropology uh, oriented too, because, you know, your body will thrive in that kind of healthy environment. The small changes really are the big changes. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining me today. I learned so much from you and I'm just amazed by your work. Well, thank you so much for having me and your audience for listening. And, you know, if people want to get little nuggets of information, nothing overwhelming, then I encourage them to, you know, check out Facebook um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It posts really good stuff, I believe, edited, bulleted stuff. Like you can just really just take away stuff. Um, Instagram is a little bit more fun, um, but still get some stuff in there, a little celebrity junk in there. But, you know, I'm trying to appeal to every age group through different platforms and, um, but always with the same really clean vetted information with no endorsements, um, no branding. It's just really straight stuff. And then also there's a newsletter and there's also a podcast where I interview really kind of cool people, um, who care stories, um, on environmental topics as well, lawyers and doctors and, you know, health and wellness people. So, you know, I encourage everyone to jump on if you're interested and, uh, and to always be well and healthy. I highly recommend her book and her podcast. Thank you again so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for reaching out. It's a pleasure.